Okay, Audrey, time to go? Yes, please. Okay, we'll do. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this um, webinar uh, sponsored by uh, the Gene Drive Research and Non-Human Organisms Committee. Um, this particular webinar is focused on field research with uh, modified organisms. I want to remind everyone on uh, the webinar that um, these are presentations for the general community, but in particular they're presentations for uh, members of the uh, National Academy of Sciences Committee uh, working to produce this report on gene drive research in non-human organisms. Therefore, at the end of the presentations, and we'll have the three presentations in order, and then we'll go to questions. And the questions uh, will have to come from committee members. Uh, our apologies, but committee uh, questions will not be coming from the general audience, just from committee members. So with that by way of introduction, let's uh, move right to our uh, first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Scott O'Neill from uh, Monash University in Melbourne. Uh, and Dr. O'Neill is going to speak to us about field release of Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes to control dengue virus transmission. So Dr. O'Neill, it's all yours. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, Are you hearing me? Okay. Yes, I'm hearing you, and and now we have your first uh, first slide up. Okay, great. So I'd like to uh, spend some time today talking to you about um, our research project, which is titled "Eliminate Dengue Up Challenge." Um, Excuse me, Dr. O'Neill. I'm I'm very sorry. We are seeing your key for your um, dial. Yes, thank you. Your voice. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so I'd like to talk about our research program titled Eliminate Dengue Art Challenge, uh, which is involving the release of mosquitoes into the environment. But one important distinction from most of this series is that we're not dealing with transgenic insects. We're dealing with insects that contain a naturally occurring bacterium. Um, that bacterium is called Wolbachia. Um, it's intracellular and it's an inherited agent, um, bacterial agent that's present in up to an estimated 60% of all species, insect species, naturally. Uh, but uh, critically, it's not found in some of the key insect disease vectors like Aedes aegypti, our target organism. And, um, and it's considered to be quite safe for humans, animals, and the environment, which I'll come back to. So the early stage of, of our research program, we're involved in transferring this bacterial agent into the mosquito Aedes aegypti so that it was inherited with the goal of using it as a control agent. So there's a number of different strains of Wolbachia. We're principally at the current time working with two main strains that are known as WML and WML pop. They have different properties in the insects and that's illustrated in these drawings. Um, and one of the most obvious differences is the density that they grow up to within the insect and that in turn affects their ability to block pathogens that the mosquitoes transmit to humans, as well as to influence the fitness of the mosquito, which in turn um, will influence the ability to invade natural populations. So the reason that we're so interested in Wolbachia is because it's now been shown to have um, a broad scale impact on the ability of different pathogens to grow in the mosquito. And if these pathogens can't grow in the mosquito, properly, then they have a reduced ability to be transmitted um, between people. And so in the literature at the moment, it's known that the presence of Wolbachia in Aedes aegypti um, will influence dengue viruses of all serotypes, yellow fever, West Nile, chikungunya, some about to be published data on Zika virus, which is very um, uh, topical at the moment in South America, where I'm currently sitting and also with a number of uh, parasitic agents, nematodes and uh, malaria parasites. Uh, from these published examples, there are predictions that uh, Wolbachia should also interfere with a range of other uh, pathogens that have not yet been demonstrated. So it's a very broad-based interference. Um, so our goal has been to try and use this phenomenon to be able to influence the ability of uh, mosquitoes to transmit pathogens 
people, and that's involved the field release of mosquitoes that contain Wolbachia. And so one of the first questions then is, you know, is Wolbachia safe uh, to release into the environment? And this slide just shows um, some, uh, you know, key points that intuitively um, would make people, I think, seem um, a little reassured that the introduction of this organism into the environment um, should be safe. But that in itself is, is, you know, maybe good for a scientist, but for a regulatory agency, not sufficient in itself. And so in the course of doing our work, um, we've had a number of major risk assessments undertaken by independent groups. And so one of the largest and most comprehensive has been undertaken by the CSIRO in Australia. Um, this risk analysis is publicly available. It's quite an extensive 100-page document that uh, details um, um, a very comprehensive set of potential hazards and then evaluation of, of the potential risk across economic, socio-political, management, environmental, biological, and potentially health hazards. And uh, this was done through a very broad-based uh, consultation process. The, the con final conclusion of, um, of this report is that there is a, um, the CSIRO does not consider that, that releasing Aedes aegypti mosquitoes containing Wolbachia propose, um, uh, represents any greater risk to the environment and people in it, um, or any great would result in more harm than just leaving a gyp die in the environment naturally and doing nothing with it. Um, this was for the first risk analysis that's been done. Since then, different um, analyses have been done in a number of other countries as well. I mention this one though because it's the most comprehensive and it's publicly available for people to view and downloadable on, on our website. So. Um, this uh, risk analysis was a, um, a key step, if you like, towards uh, regulatory approval. And um, I'll talk a little bit more in a couple of slides about regulatory approval. But in, uh, for us and our project going forward, regulatory approval has just been one component of what we've been wanting to, to um, if you like, uh, a form of authorization to undertake this work. We've also been wanting uh, very strongly to have community support for the work. And so a large part of what um, we've been doing is a very comprehensive community engagement program to support our work. In the early uh, trials that we undertook, we moved to, um, we worked in an in a individual consent format, like a medical research uh, um, consent format, where we actually um, went uh, to people on, a, on an individual basis and after a, a considerable period of, of community engagement, um, ask them to actually sign up, if you like, to participation forms that would consent to releasing mosquitoes near their properties. And, uh, and those uh, people had the option to say no to those releases, in which case we would respond by not releasing a certain area around them. Um, this, this type of approach to consent from the community was a useful approach when we were doing small trials, but it's not something that could readily scale when we think about wanting to do releases on a whole city uh, level. And so we've since moved to what we would call a public acceptance model for community engagement. Um, and the main elements of this model um, that go out to scale is that we adhere to a set of public participation principles, which I'll show you. We utilize a community reference group to oversee what we're doing. Um, we support what we're doing with quantitative social research to get a better understanding of uh, the depth of understanding of the community and their, um, uh, their feelings towards the work we're doing and their support for it. We support it with um, significant uh, media campaigns and central to this is having an active issues and grievance management system where we can deal with people that have concerns and deal with those concerns. So this slide just um, lays out the public participation principles um, that we are respectful, um, that we listen to all of the issues that are raised by people and consider them valid and properly considered. We're inclusive and in that we wish to make sure that we are able to reach all of the major groups within our communities to be able to inform them about the project. Um, we're very committed to being transparent with project information, um, and we're responsive 
uh, to concerns that people may have. We have a commitment that we are able to get back to people very quickly um, and be able to listen to people's concerns and, and help to resolve them. And finally, that we're committed to being honest in our communications and that we're um, always factual about what we are talking about and, uh, and, and we make um, um, the information available in appropriate form and languages in some cases that people that are interested can understand it. So, um, with regards to community support, we're wanting our engagement to be quite authentic, and that um, authentic engagement involves face-to-face -face where possible, uh, written materials, a social media campaign, local media uh, utilisation, and that engagement uh, is not just done before, but it's also during releases and also after releases. Um, we're very committed to being accessible and being able to answer people's questions and, as I said before, respectful and inclusive. These two images show you our community engagement programs in action. This first one is in the city of Medellin in Colombia where we're working, and this is a, a school play being performed uh, around the Wolbachia project uh, to school children in a release area, informing them about uh, the program and what it's saying. What it and here in Australia, we can see a community reference group meeting uh, where we have senior members of the community where we're working that are providing oversight, almost like a, a board structure in the community engagement uh, sphere, um, providing advice and, and guidance to us. And also to ensure that we have met our commitment around the public participation principles and that they're um, convinced that we have made um, the, all the efforts that we have stated we would around engagement and obtaining authorization. So we are now um, releasing mosquitoes in five countries that are listed here. And this slide just summarizes how we've gone about uh, regulatory approval in those different countries. And the key point I would make here is that um, regulatory approval has been treated uh, differently in every country that we've worked in. So there hasn't been one formulaic approach to regulatory approval. It's needed to be a bespoke approach in each country. And I think you know, a key point for us is that early on, early on in the process, um, we felt that, um, rather arrogantly probably, that if people saw um, what had been done around risk analysis and um, regulatory approval processes in a country like Australia, which has a very rigorous uh, approval process for releasing organisms in the environment, that that would reassure them in their own countries. And our lesson to date is that each country is, is, uh, has its own process and is quite proud of that independence and um, doesn't really take that much notice of what other countries have done. And so we have found that we have needed to approach each country on a case-by-case -case basis without the presumption that what has been done in other countries will influence that country and its decisions around regulatory approval. So just basically how this works is if you could imagine a population of mosquitoes prior to our intervention taking place, we would then undergo a period of releases, a number of weeks, where mosquitoes containing Wolbachia would be released into the environment, which would raise the Wolbachia level within the population above a point where it should be able to sustain itself. And then releases would stop and we would see the Wolbachia level continue to increase until all mosquitoes in, or close to all mosquitoes in the environment would have it and then should maintain it. And so these releases are usually done as either adult releases, as seen here in Colombia, or egg releases where eggs are put into buckets of water. And this is the egg release modality is what is most commonly being done around the world at the moment. So um, these slides are from Indonesia, just showing you how simple it is for this deployment to take place, that in, a, in a, a laboratory setting we make egg strips that are collections of mosquito eggs on strips, but these can be then placed into a container with some water and uh, a small amount of mosquito food, um, and then placed out into, into an area outside the house where people live, and uh, the mosquitoes then grow up in these containers and then release themselves into the environment. And then the containers are, are picked back up and returned to be reused. So as I said, we're, we're doing work in five countries at the moment. 
I'll just really focus just because of the limitation of time on Australia. Um, we've been working now with releasing mosquitoes for over four years and this is uh, around the city of Cairns in Australia, a tourist city in the north of the, of the country, northeast of the country, and all of these dots represent different locations where release experiments have been undertaken. Um, all of these initial experiments were all done with entomological endpoints of wanting to understand how best to scale up the approach and how best to deploy. In 2015, we've expanded our trial to really, if you like, fill in uh, the rest of the Cairns uh, inner city area so that we have a deployment now sitting over the main residential high risk area for dengue um, in Cairns. Um, so when those initial trials were done in two locations, this just shows you the results that the, we had a period of release over a small period of time. The Wolbachia levels increased until they, after we stopped releasing, went to fixation or very close to it. And then without us doing anything, they've been maintaining themselves in the wild population now for four years and coming up to five years. Encouragingly, we've not seen any locally acquired dengue cases in these locations where we've released or actually in any other locations around the world where we've been re releasing and it's established we're back there up to levels above 80%. Um, in uh, the city of Townsville in Australia, which is just south of Cairns, We've this year carried out our first full-scale deployment of all back here mosquitoes across the whole city. Um, and this is where we're able to trial the new um, community-based um, community engagement approach and also focused on developing a low cost or reducing the cost of the method. And so this is just an overview of the city of Townsville and showing you what we call our phase one site, which uh, encompasses a number of uh, inner city suburbs, which is the highest risk area for dengue in this city. And this uh, heat map, if you like, is just showing um, in September what the current state of Bulbakia establishment was in each of these areas. It has since now gone up to high in all levels. Um, so in this, what we call a stage one of the council deployment, um, this was covering an area of around 50,000 people, 15,000 residences. Um, we released over a one-year period about 1.3 million mosquitoes, which sounds like it's quite a lot, but actually when you look at mosquito release programs with different technologies, this is actually very small numbers of, of mosquitoes. And in this research context, the cost of doing this per person in the residential area is around $16 per person. This little area here shows you how that $16 is composed. And I just want to make a point that you know almost a quarter of that um, cost fits in the engagement. So you know, just to give you an idea of how seriously we take the community engagement um, um, priority, if you like, in the project. Um, I'd also say that this seems like quite a large amount of money. Um, we have an this is an area-wide deployment. If we were to take this same methodology and put it over a similar area of 38 square kilometres in Asia when the per person cost of that just because of the increased population density would come down closer to $2 per person. Um, we're now gearing up in Townsville for what we call stages two to four um, that will be starting in January. And this is where we're really moving towards expanding the size of the release area in this city, but also moving into public participation um, for the release. And so for people in the US, you may be familiar with these sort of noodle boxes. These are, this is a form of release container which we are giving out to the public where they can actually add the mosquitoes, the eggs, the, the water and so forth and put them in their gardens to release the mosquitoes themselves. Um, we're also um, uh, doing mosquito deployments with school children. And the school programs are interesting in that they provide for a citizen science component to what we're doing but also a very good community engagement tool back to adults within the community through children in schools. And so we've been targeting so far uh, five to 12 year olds. We've only done a small pilot of 105 um, children so far. These children are doing three series of releases in their gardens of their houses and then it's packaged up in, um, in a piece of science that's um, associated with watching the mosquito life cycle, et cetera. And then um, our staff are QAing around 10% of the buckets that are being released. We've learned a lot from this first program and we're expanding this program now in the next stages of the council introduction to introduce it to more schools and to also have high school students involved in the monitoring of the Wolbachia frequencies within the community. 
And so far the uptake from people in doing this and schools and teachers, uh, parents and students has been incredibly enthusiastic. So I've just been talking about Australia, but uh, we also have um, release programs underway in Indonesia in the city of Yogyakarta, in Vietnam in the city of Nha Trang, in Brazil in Rio where I'm currently sitting right now as I'm talking to you, and also in Medellin in Colombia. The, the areas in, in red are the collaborating institutions from which scientists are working with us on the program. Um, we're really focused on two things at the moment, how to scale up deployment and reduce costs, and then secondly, how to um, get um, gold standard efficacy data, and we have a large efficacy trial just about to start in Indonesia. And so then, um, just to, to, well, one last thing to say before I finish up is that we're also developing a very large support system um, for uh, future uh, cities or countries that wish to come on board where we're able to provide a training environment uh, to allow people to, to understand how best to use the methodology for deployment. Um, and that includes all aspects from regulatory community engagement right through to growing mosquitoes and releasing them. So it covers knowledge transfer and all of the core program methodologies. Um, we include downloadable protocols, templates, troubleshooting guides um, to help guide people through the various aspects involved in undertaking their own releases. Um, we have, through this uh, forum, an opportunity for real-time access to expertise and advice through exchanges. And we also um, do all of this in multiple languages, so there's real-time translation between, at the moment, the five countries that are participating in open releases, but the goal is that that will uh, grow as the more countries join. So finally, that, uh, just to make a point that um, we're an, an international research collaboration at the moment, we're not for profit, and uh, listed on this slide are our major uh, funders, um, and of which um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is by far the most uh, significant, although the Wellcome Trust is now joining in a very significant way as well. Um, and then we have many different people from around the world working on this program um, in many countries, and here this slide just lists some of the main scientific leaders in the various countries that are involved in the work. And that's, uh, that's my presentation. Okay, excellent. Uh, thanks very much for that presentation. You're obviously doing lots of things associated with outreach. Terrific. Uh, 